you ain't gonna need it is what Yagni stands for and the references to yaks will become clear as the talk proceeds. Um, like I said earlier, I'm I, I don't want to speak too long. I'm actually interested in what other people think and what other people's opinions are. So um, I'm going to try and do this fairly quickly. Uh, I'm going to talk about three different aspects um, of thinking about projects, thinking about getting stuff done. Uh, the planning stage, architecture, and actual coding. So let's just start with the planning stage. Now. Any of us who were trained as project managers back in the 80s, 90s, will remember this diagram. Yeah? Now, it makes a fundamental assumption that you have to deliver everything. Yeah? And it differs. The question is, what, what did Agile do to that diagram? What did it change? Um, and when I was reading this book, um, I uh, came across this lovely picture. Which, and these are the actual constraints of any project. And as you can see on the end, um, what they added, what the um, Agile people added, was they realized that scope can actually change. And this is, in fact, we were having a discussion when we were having coffee earlier. Um, quite often, um, it's, it's the one thing that your old-fashioned uh, British command and control managers still don't understand, is they want everything, uh, even if there's a vanishingly small percentage of stuff that people are actually going to use. Um, but the main thing is that you know, what we can vary is scope. Uh, and then back to the Agile Manifesto again, um, one of the things it actually says is maximizing the work not done. And at the planning stage, what you're doing is you're actually thinking about, well, here's a list of requirements. What am I going to do in this iteration, whether it's a sprint or it's a bunch of stuff you've stuck on your Kanban board or whatever. Um, and what am I not going to do? So you've actually got this whole um, thing about, you know, what am I not doing and what I'm controlling the scope. So when you're planning, you're controlling the scope, which is actually, even though we in this room, it, it's obvious to us. Back when I was being trained as a project manager in, you know, a million years ago, it wasn't obvious. And, and that's one of the things the Agile movement gave us all. So it's about managing your backlog working out what you're going to deliver, working out how you're going to deliver it. OK, so that's briefly when you're planning, you know, it's, it's making sure you, you, you're doing what you want to do. Now, architecture, this is an interesting problem. Um, lots of people talk about uh, agile processes and doing the architecture as you go along. And lots of people say they don't know how to do it. Um, and I have to acknowledge a debt here. I haven't stolen Dan's presentation, but I've stolen some of his ideas, and I, I don't want to be seen to be the guy that came up with them. So he talks about complification. Um, and I thought this is an example. I'm not sure if this, this roundabout is still in Swindon or not. Um, but it's an example of the human tendency um, to take um, a simple thing and see a pattern that isn't there, because when we were you know, running across the tundra all those millions of years ago, it, imagining there was a lion there and running away from it, and seeing a lion there and running away from it actually meant, the, you know, meant we survived, regardless of which. And we, as human beings, we have this tendency to see patterns, to look for solutions, where in fact, this is just five roads joining. You know, an ordinary roundabout, okay, it's not as much fun to build, but <laughs> it would meet the requirement. I also love this yellow bus here. I think he's lost. It's great, isn't it? It's great. Um, I don't know if this roundabout still exists. Um, you used to approach it, and there'd be this sign like a kid's drawing of an octopus. And it'd be like, oh, God. <laughs> um, so this is one of the problems with complification. We actually seek complexity. And we've all been in planning meetings, um, architectural meetings, whatever meetings, and people, somebody, somebody keeps saying, but what if, but what if, but what if, but what if? And it means we're focusing in on the detail instead of taking a step back and thinking, you know, well, what's the broad picture here? What, you know, what's, the, what's the, the 20 percent in the Pareto sense? So if you're right next to this picture, of a, if you're right next to this um, sculpture of a thumb, you might not realize it's a thumb. But, you know, if you're actually in the distance, as this uh, young gentleman on Flickr discovered, you can do this and see that it's a thumb. Um, 
So simplification is another one of Dan North's made up words, but it's about taking a step back, having a really good look from a distance at the thing that, that, that's been obsessing you and making sure that it is actually something that you, you're in, you want to do. So again, we're seeking complexity. We keep saying, but what if? And, and you need to be um, the devil's advocate a lot of the time to say, will it? Um, the agile, uh, not the, the other talk I gave, actually, I actually had um, a picture of a, of a dead fish. You know, I talked about how you need to let evolution decide whether an idea or a, a piece of code lives or dies, as in it has to justify its existence and it has to be able to, to persist, you know, it has to be able to you know, or, or, persist in it across uh, the different um, you know, iterations of your code. A good way of getting to whether something's worth doing or whether something, why something's broken is the five whys technique. Uh, is anyone here familiar with this technique? I thought so. Um, Jeff Bezos, the guy that um, owns Amazon, um, is actually a, a great exemplar of this. And if you look for five whys, there's quite a few interesting stories where he's used it to solve problems at Amazon. And Amazon definitely know what they're doing, I would think. So it's, it's, it's a useful technique. You just keep asking why until you get to the root cause. So it might not be five, it might be 10. And um, sometimes you find you're reaching an interface with another company or another organizational silo. But that at least means you, know, need to, you now know that you need to go and have a conversation with those people. So it's a, it's a useful thing. And then certainly if you're talking about architectures, if you're talking about interfaces, you're getting to where the, the meat is. OK, um, this picture here, it's, you know, if ignorance is bliss, this must, this must be an orgy. As you can see. These guys have, have, have stacked these things that say do not stack, uh, lots of them, right? And the other thing about architecture, and the other thing that, that Dan talks about, but again, it's one of those things that's blinding obvious when somebody's pointed it out, is homing in on your own ignorance. Now this, um, that picture is basically saying, oh, isn't the, the, the truck driver, the, the forklift driver stupid for ignoring the label? But who's actually being stupid there? Who designed a warehouse where the guy could stack things that, not, that aren't meant to be stacked? Who's the person that maybe designed the packaging saying, oh, I, I don't want this to be stacked, but in fact, all the warehouses that that product is going to go to, that's the only way you can store things. So the designer of the packaging can say, do not, do not stack, but the guy with the forklift's like, yeah, right, OK. I still need to get it off the truck. And I think. Us, as people who design complex systems, who design software, who manage complex systems, who try to herd cats, uh, sorry, manage developers, um, we actually need to be a lot more humble. And, and when I'm talking about homing, it's our ignorance. If our users are doing something stupid, it's because we were stupid, not because they were stupid. And we need to be an awful lot more humble. And again, you ain't going to need it. You've got to be very, very conscious of uh, are you actually you know, building something like the, that, that picture in the, in, of the roundabout in Slough. Sorry, Swindon, bless it. Another thing about architecture, in fact, we were talking about this at coffee as well. Um, this is a picture of some silos, yeah? Um, and essentially, the grain in this silo can't mix with the grain in that silo, and they're, they're separate. It's a metaphor for the way a lot of organizations work. Um, and essentially, you have your call center here, you have your accounts department here. I'm speaking from bitter experience here. Um, and essentially, the call center people were the ones that commissioned the software. And they can just create orders, edit them, whatever they like, but there's no ledger. And then the accounts guys go, oh, right. <laughs> How do I account for the money that's flowing through the company? And because people were thinking in silos, you might build an accounts package, you might build a call center package, you might build an operations package. And because we, as human beings, we think hierarchically, we think org charts, and we see these divisions, what we do is we, we, we do these point solutions and then get some string, bit of chewing gum, plastic, cat gut, whatever, and try and join them together with interfaces and what have you. Um, and it, it means that actually it doesn't map the needs of the business particularly well. It, things function, otherwise companies would go bust, but it isn't fun, is it? Um, I've reread this book recently. Um, it's a bit of a Java fest, but there's some brilliant ideas in here. Um, and one of the things they talk about when you're in, in, doing the inception of um, a piece of code or a project is this. 
which is a walking skeleton. I love the high heels as well, they're great. Um, <laughs> the, but the point with a walking skeleton is it's a slice that goes right the way through the organization. So in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the example I was giving before, you start with the call center and then you look all the way through to how a single penny gets taken here, gets refunded, get all the other processes that may happen and ends up in the books. And because you look at a slice across the organization, you actually end up with a process that meets the needs of the organization, not with a process that optimizes each silo and breaks every time you have high demand here or low demand there. Um, that's a slice, sorry, feeble. Um, one of the uh, things uh, we um, started to do it on the beach and we started to, um, to we're moving toward, to Kanban away from Scrum. And one of the things we're talking about is minimum marketable feature, which is essentially something you can ship, a slice. And even if it's very thin and you know, your penny gets arrived here and a, a little green box appears at the other end, you've explored all of the architecture. So in terms of Yagni, in terms of you ain't gonna need it, you actually, you're, you're, you're going the other way and homing in what you do need and you're doing it across the whole organization. Okay, so we've covered architecture. Now we're gonna have a quick look at coding. Actually, um, coding is probably the guts of what the talk here. Um, the interesting thing about trying to do Yagni principles, if, if you're a beginner, you need context-free rules, which is basically do this, do this, do this, do this. If you see it's blue, then do that. That's the only way beginners can function. And a beginner is someone who follows a recipe, like you know, a cooking recipe. But an expert, on the other hand, knows by intuition. You know an expert cook can look at something and that oven's slightly hotter than the one they're used to, they know it's done. But a beginner would say, oh no, we haven't had 22 and a half minutes yet. So it, it's, it's an intuitional thing, it's a visceral thing. And I think it's the same in, in, in writing uh, software and delivering, uh, in delivering complex systems. When you're experienced, um, Martin Fowler talks about, um, in, in his refactoring book, excellent book by the way, um, the, the thing about a code smell. You look at something and you just go, ah, it's just not, I can't put my finger on it, but I've written code like this before and it bit me. You know, and Fowler bless him, you know, he's actually categorized those and given us a language to talk about the code smells, which is great. Um, but it's, it's a very, um, it's very difficult when, it, when you're an expert to explain things necessarily. Um, the other thing the problem beginners have is this idea of infinite regress. You don't know where the detail stops. You don't know where the line is drawn. So you get paralyzed because you, you have too many choices. Um, someone who's an expert, on the other hand, has been here before in some guise and knows where the barriers are. There's a, there's a sort of martial arts thing about, you know, the master um, has very few choices in a given situation, whereas the beginner is overwhelmed by them, which is why the master can overwhelm the beginner, because the master knows what works. 